I'm going to ask you to turn once again in the Word of God to the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter number 5, 1 John chapter number 5, we have been working our way through 1 John since uh, the fall, I believe it was October when we started and we come now to uh, the final four verses in this letter called 1 John. Today we'll be looking at verses 18 and 19. Have you ever known someone that came across as a (laughs) know-it-all? Don't point to them. (laughs) Please don't do that. If you have never heard that term, it is referring to someone who speaks and acts like they possess all of the answers for any question or problem. They They come across as having a superior knowledge about anything that is above anybody. They just come across like they know it all. Although they may not intend to, that is the the spirit, the attitude that they convey. I'll ask you that question because the Apostle John has used the word know over and over again in this letter that bears his name. As a matter of fact, 35 times in this letter, it it is without question uh, one of the key words of the entire letter called 1 John. And now as we see this letter coming to a close, you will notice with me, three out of the last four verses begins with the words, we know, we know. But keep in mind that John was the last of the Lord's living disciples. He lived to nearly the end of the first century. However, he knew that his days were numbered and that he would not live on this earth and in that particular body forever. He had lived long enough, however, to see the influence of false teachers upon the early church and the false doctrines that they taught and the doubt that they had caused in the minds of some of the second century or second generation, I should say, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we find here with urgency and confidence and the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote about some of the foundational certainties of the faith that he knew to be true. You see, John did not speak of knowing certain things about spiritual matters due to his high opinion of himself, but due to the divine revelation of Jesus Christ and the fact that he had been an eyewitness of all of these things that he wrote about. We find that he knew them to be true because he had heard Jesus teach them. He had watched Jesus live. He had seen Jesus die on Calvary's cross. And he had seen Jesus the day that he arose from the dead. And 40 days later, he saw Jesus ascend into heaven. He was an eyewitness to it all. He had been empowered and illuminated by the Holy Spirit. So because of this spiritual knowledge that had had come from the Lord, he could write with certainty these words that we see before us this morning, beginning in verse 18, where it says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. The first thing I'd like you to notice with me from verse number 18 is the condition of a Christian in regards to sinning. I don't know about you, but that gets my attention right away where he says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Well, I have been born again and I still sin. So what is that talking about? Well, it's important to note, first of all, that John is speaking here of a particular group of people that that he has spoken of throughout the letter. That is those that have been born of God. What does that mean? Well, it means to be born from above. It means to be born spiritually. The uh, the scripture is uh, also referred to 
as the new birth or regeneration. You see, not everybody who claims to be a Christian has been born of God. The term Christian has, has become a, a general term since the, the Bible was written and since the apostles lived. So it's not enough to just say, well, I am a Christian. But a true Christian has been born of God. Like Jesus explained to Nicodemus in John chapter number 3 when he said to this religious man, you must be born again. Now that word born is speaking of a relationship that was begun in the past but has continuing results. And it's describing a change and a condition within that person that has been born of God. Being born again brings a change into our life. We are born one time physically, we are born spiritually, but the results of, of both of those things will be ongoing. I had a little grandson born back in uh, January, January the 30th, I believe it was. And um, we have been up there to see him twice. We, we FaceTime weekly, and every week there's a change. He, he is, he's, he's growing. He is, uh, he's getting bigger. He looks like the Michelin man on the tire commercial. He's got a lot of baby fat. And I'm glad he does because they named him Bear. Bear, how about that? He better be, he better be big and, and brawny, hadn't he? But there's change taking place. And that's normal, that's natural. And so it is for the believer that has been born of God. What this is teaching us is that no one who has been transformed by the new birth will go on living in an unbroken pattern of sin. John is simply repeating and summarizing what he has already stated and written earlier about those who practice righteousness and those who practice sinning. And we have learned about this from the very first chapter and onward through the letter. As Christians, we do sin, but we do not live in or delight in sin, but are to live in continual confession of our sinfulness as we see expressed. If you'll turn back to chapter 1 with me, please, and just want you to review these verses very quickly about what John wrote from the very outset and what he has been talking about throughout the letter regarding God's children and sin. Begin reading with me then. In, here in verse number 5, chapter 1, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, speaking of Christ, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. My little children, these things write out unto you, that you sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So we find here that we have an advocate. We have an advocate, and that advocate is Jesus Christ, the righteous one who never sinned. This changed condition of born-again believers is also described in chapter 3. Would you turn over there, please? And I want you to notice the distinction that is drawn here between the pattern of life and the character of those who have been born of God. Notice with me in chapter 3, beginning in verse number 4, what it says in these verses. Beginning in verse 4, it says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. 
and you, and, and you know that he was manifested, talking about Christ, to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he, speaking of Christ, is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. So we find here that the, the genuine pattern of a believer's life is righteousness. Not perfection, not sinless perfection, but a direction of righteousness like Christ. True believers have a desire to please the Lord and, experience, don't, and not experience uh, the regret and the, the remorse and, and, and so forth that goes along when we sin against the Lord. Now why is that? Well look at verse number 9 there in chapter 3. It says, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin or does not continue in sin. Why? For his seed remaineth in him. Whose seed remains in him? God's seed. God's seed remains in him. God's nature is given to the person that is born of God. Just like you have the, the nature and the, and the genes of your earthly parents, there's nothing we can do about that, whether it be good or bad. The person that has been born of God is given the divine nature, a new nature. A new nature to do what is right, to please the Lord. And if you have been born again, you will have that desire to do right. And you and I cannot continue in a lifestyle and a pattern of sinfulness that characterizes our life without being convicted, without being found guilty in our conscience that we are sinning against our Lord. It's an impossibility because his seed remains in us. Those who have been born of God cannot continue sinning and not be uncomfortable and unconcerned about it. We cannot go on and on in a habitual lifestyle because we have been born of God. Now if you turn back to chapter 5 and verse 18, I want you to see here that this changed condition is conveyed in the tense of the word sins or sinneth and the meaning of that which refers as I mentioned continuous sin a course of continual sinning those who have been born again are not sinless but as I've said before in this series they certainly should have a desire to sin less and not live a lifestyle which is characterized by sin this is one of the certainties that John has been emphasizing throughout this letter and that he feels necessary through the inspiration of the Spirit to emphasize it again before he closes and that we need to be reminded of this often because a soft approach to sin is deceptive, dangerous, and distorts the doctrine of God's grace while denying the life-changing power of the gospel of Christ and the new birth. So we see the certainty of the believer's condition regarding sin. Notice the second thing we see here, the second certainty, and that's the protection of a Christian in regards to Satan. Verse number 18, we just read, and I want you to call your attention once again to that verse, and the word keeps or keepeth. And that word means to stand guard or protect like a, a sentry at his post. And it's teaching us that as born-again believers, we must be on guard and not taken off guard by the devices and deception of Satan, but we are to put on the whole armor of God, which we're told to do in Ephesians 6. Believers are commanded elsewhere in James 4 and verse 7, 1 Peter 5 and verses 8 and 9, to resist the devil. So there is a personal responsibility 
in this matter of being on guard against Satan. But don't miss this. Not only there is there a personal responsibility on the believer's part, ultimately, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who can continually preserve us and protect us from the wicked one in this verse who is talking about Satan. All right? So there's a personal responsibility that I am to be aware of the fact that Satan is as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. And I'm to resist him in the strength of the Lord. But ultimately, I do not have the power to keep myself saved. I don't have the power to live a righteous enough life to keep my salvation. You see, we are not kept by our own power. We are guarded and protected by the power of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that because that verb in verse number 18 where it is talking about to, to, to lay hold of or to uh, fasten or to grasp. That's what the word touch there means. It means to lay hold of something. It's not just reaching out and touching it, but it's reaching out and fastening our hands to it and grasping it with the intention to harm permanently and eternally. And it's speaking of what the wicked one, the devil, wants to do with God's children. And what this is speaking of here is the keeping and protecting power of God and the broken power of Satan in regards to believers. And it's teaching us that no child of God will be laid hold of by Satan. And that's good news, isn't it? Reminds you of what the Lord Jesus said. If you'll turn over and keep your place here to John 10, these are verses that all of us ought to be familiar with. John chapter number 10, and of course this is the chapter where Jesus presents himself as the good shepherd. And you'll notice with me him speaking of himself and his father in verse number 27 in regards to their relationship with his sheep or his children. Notice what verse number 27. 27 says my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me well that's a, that's a sermon in itself that I'll not preach this morning he goes on to say and I give you give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand my father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So we find here that no child of God can be taken out of the hand of Almighty God. The Son has a hold of them, and the Father has a hold of them as one. Now look back there again in verse number uh, 8 of John, 1 John chapter 3. Turn back there with me, please. We were there just a moment ago. Look at that verse again. You'll notice there it says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested or revealed that he, speaking of Christ, might destroy the works of the devil. You see, through Christ's sinless life, his sacrificial death, his glorious resurrection, he has defeated the devil. And though the devil would like to take you and I to an eternal hell, he cannot, if we are in the hand of the Father and the Son, nobody can pluck us out of their hand. Though Satan still possesses the power to attack us and try, try to destroy our testimony, to tempt us, to deceive us into sinning, as far as believers go, he will never be able to regain his grip on any child of God for eternity. One author wrote, the slimy fingers of Satan will never regain an abiding grip on the redeemed soul. And to that I say, Amen. Our security as believers is not in our grip on Christ, but it's his grip on us. And his grip don't slip, my friend. He is the God of the universe. 
And it's very clear that Satan cannot get hold of a child of God. That leads us to the third and final certainty we'll look at here this morning. And that's found in verse number 19. And that's the position of a Christian in regard to the world system. Notice verse number 19, another we know here. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Now there's two distinct positions that are given here which represent the kingdom of God and Satan's domain. You see, my friend, as much as people would like to deny it today, there is right and wrong. There is good and evil. There is light and darkness. There is truth and there are lies. All right? And we need to understand that. And you'll notice there it says, We know that we are of God. That's that's coming off of verse number 18. Those that have been born of God, out of God, we have been born of God. It's speaking of believers. His seed or his nature remains in them. This speaks of the spiritual assurance we have as his child. We receive that from the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. We receive that from the inspired Word of God. Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, Himself beareth witness with our spirit, little less, that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit of God indwells every born-again Christian, and He will give assurance to us that we are children of God. There is an inner assurance. There should be an outward manifestation of that by the way we live. We have been changed. We are of God because we are in Christ. So there's two groups here, either of God or of the world. 1 John 2, 15 told us that, where it said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. But if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and and the pride of life and, and the lust of the eyes is not of the Father, but is of the world. And so we find here that God makes a distinction. There are those that are of God. There are those that are of the world. There's no in-between. Now when we say the world, we're not talking about the earth. We're not talking about the universe in this case. But in this case, it's talking about the evil world system that is under the control of Satan and that opposes everything that God is trying to do. While the Christian is in the grip of God, the unbeliever is in the grip of Satan, and they may not even know that. You'll notice it says there in the latter part of verse 19, and the whole world, the whole world lieth in wickedness. In other words, the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. The whole world lies under the sway of the evil one who is Satan. And this whole world system whether it be entertainment, whether it be education, whether it be uh, the media, whether it be politics, whether it be religions, they lie under the dominating influence and the control of the devil. That's what this is saying. That word lies or lieth, it literally is talking about reclining like a a child lying in the lap of a a parent, lying there asleep. I can remember going to sleep in the car, and some of y'all have little children now, and they they do that, and usually you're you're glad that they do. Maybe they need a nap or something. But we didn't have car seats and everything uh, back when we were growing up. Some cars didn't even have any seat belts in them, and it, it wasn't a law to wear uh, it wasn't a law that you had to, to wear them. So at nighttime, when we'd be on the way home from somewhere, we would just sprawl out in the back seat, and we'd go to sleep. And when we came home, I remember times really being asleep and sensing my dad picking me up and carrying me into the house and putting me in, in my bed. How many of you remember that? Okay. There were a few times when I had woke up, but I acted like I was asleep because I didn't want to walk in there. I wanted Daddy to carry me. 
you know, when a parent is carrying a, a child, it, 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 it's, a th it's a precious thing because the child is just laying there trusting the parent and they're really uh, under the parent's control. And, uh, and, and the child is just lying there in their arms or in their lap. That's the imagery here, but it's not a sweet one because it's one of the whole world lying in the lap of the devil. And they feel like that everything is good and everything is fine and dandy and, and all of these people that claim to know God are, are, are out of their mind. And they just need to ch the, the Christians just need to chill out because they've got everything under control in the world. But my friend, they have been lulled to sleep by the devil. And if that's where you're at this morning, you better wake up. You better wake up because there is a God in heaven and there is a devil that desires to, to damn our souls and to destroy our lives and to steal from us uh, the most precious things that God has given to us. Don't be lulled to sleep. Don't be lulled to sleep, young person, by your cell phone. Don't be deceived by, by some of the lies that, that are on there. I would encourage you to wake up Look at God's Word. Look at the inspired Word of God for truth. And if it doesn't line up with the Bible, then put it aside. We find that this imagery of lying under the sway of the evil one is very clear here. The Lord's told us in 1 John 2, 17, The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. What that's saying is all of the glitter and glamour that Hollywood presents and, and that uh, people present as being, you've got to have this, you've got to do that, you can't be happy without that car or those clothes or those shoes or this much money, all of that's going to pass away. It's going to pass away. But there's only one who will never pass away. And that's our Creator and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to be living to please them. Don't be lulled asleep by Satan's lies, lust, and allurements of the world as the majority of humanity. Notice there it says the whole world. So you're going to be in a minority. So was Noah's kids. But they lived while the rest of the world died. They were in the minority. But Noah listened to the Lord. And thankfully, his children and their wives listened to Noah. Be an overcomer and a winner by being born of God, as we see here in chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. So let's apply this to our lives this morning. Do you know your condition in regards to sin? Do you know that your sins are under the blood of Christ? You have been forgiven. You have put your faith in Him for your salvation and your eternal destiny. You've placed your faith in what He did for you on the cross. The fact that He died for you and rose again. Have you put your faith in Him? You need to know where you're at in that regard. That's the most important decision you ever made. But then if you are a child of God, are you continually confessing your sin? Am I forsaking my sin? As the Holy Spirit says to me through the Word of God, you don't need to be looking at that. You're one of my children. You don't need to be talking like that. You don't need to be going there and doing those things. Are we listening? Are we confessing and forsaking? Number two, are you resting in His protection? Are you trusting in the power of Almighty God to keep you? Or do you think that you have to keep yourself safe? Therefore, every time you, you sin, you, you realize that, that you can't live a sinless life and you think that you've lost your salvation. My friend, if we could earn our salvation, why did Jesus have to die? He expects us to live right, but we cannot live eternally by just trying to live a perfect life. Are you resting in his protection? Oh yes, Satan will attack us. He attacked Peter 
before Jesus went to the cross. He attacked the apostle Paul. It says that, that the messenger of Satan buffeted Paul. But Paul was secure in Christ. And the Lord Jesus said to Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, 9, or 2 Corinthians, I can't remember which one, my grace is sufficient for you. So we need to be resting in his protection. Last of all, what position are you in? Are you lying under the power and control of God, of Jesus Christ? Are you lying in the lap of the devil where the rest of the world is? Well, I'm here to tell you this morning, the world will pass away, but his will will lead us to abiding forever. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Shall we pray together with our heads bowed and eyes closed?